okay, it looks like most people have made it in through, through the waiting room. I know there's still one or two people just still to join us. But as I said, we do have quite a lot that we need to get through this weekend, as you can imagine. Um, hopefully everyone has, has had a chance to look at the kind of overview um, document that we, we sent you. I know it was quite long, but this is the work you guys have been doing. And so it's really important that, you know, we, we sort of look at that and take that into account and recognize the range of things that you've all been considering. So that overview document that had both the kind of where we are in sort of possible recommendations, a re little reminder, because we've, we've covered so much material, a little reminder of sort of the current situation, and then the sort of commentary column, which was, which is largely Alan and Meg who've been with us the whole way, Alan and Meg who've been with us the whole way through this process and regularly speaking to you. So stepping back and starting to look at, well, you know, here's some, here's some sort of critical friends, hopefully some sort of helpful suggestions about thinking how we can make sure that the recommendations that you as an assembly put forward and go forward in the report and use them to be presented to, to people in government and parliament actually have the most impact. So that commentary is there as, as sort of suggestions and support and both Alan and Meg will be with us all weekend able to be called into the rooms if there are things that you want clarified or you know or, or a little bit more sort of explanation around. But before we get into the the business of the weekend, we have a short video that's been made. You'll recognize some of the people in it, people from right across the political spectrum who um, just want to send you a bit of a message to, to help us focus in on what we're trying to do today. So James, are you able to play that video? Hello, my name's Shami Chakrabarti. Hello, I'm Joanna Cherry, Member of Parliament for Edinburgh South West. I'm Francis Foley, Deputy Director of Compass. I'm Jane Martin, I'm an independent member of the Committee on Standards in Public Life. I'm Arnand Menon, you may remember me. I'm the one who came into one of your earlier sessions and droned on about citizen participation. I'm David Jones and I'm the Member of Parliament for Clwyd West in North Wales. Over the past five weekends, at the Citizens' Assembly on Democracy in the UK, you've been debating the crucial question of how should the UK's democracy work. The first thing I'd like to do is to thank you so much for, for contributing to this project, for taking part so enthusiastically. For giving up your weekends during an incredibly difficult time for us all. For opening yourselves up to new ideas and experiences. Democracy works best when citizens are informed, when they're engaged, and when they're willing to listen to other points of view. And this Citizens' Assembly has been a great example of that. I'm a Labour member of the House of Lords and more broadly a campaigner for change and for building a more robust democracy. So your work and your conclusions are going to help me in that project and that work. I'm thinking about what democracy in Scotland should look like and your recommendations will help me understand what matters most to people. I'm a member of the House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee and your proposals will help me and my colleagues understand how people across the UK want to see our democracy develop. I get asked to speak about the state of democracy quite a lot and the one thing I can tell you is this. Your recommendations and perhaps even more so, the way you've gone about carrying out your deliberations, talking and as importantly, listening to each other, they're going to shape what I say about democracy in this country in the future. As a member of the Committee on Standards in Public Life, I know how important it is in a democracy for people to be aware of how the system works and to have a strong voice in it. We campaign for democratic reform here in the UK and your proposals will help us work to build a democracy that works for everyone. So. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. thank you so much. Thank you all so very much. And although they're thanking you, 
we've still got a lot of work to do, but hopefully, you know, by the end of today, we will have some really clear things that them and many, many other people are really looking forward to actually seeing well, what, you know, after spending these five weekends and we'll be six by the time we get to the end of it, what are the conclusions? What are the things that are coming out as being really important to people about looking for the future of a good democracy in the UK? So I'm going to get on now and start with the kind of business of state and I'm going to share my screen to take us through what we're going to be covering over the weekend. Just give it a second, All right? So again, as I've said, welcome. Welcome to the uh, sixth and final weekend of the Citizen Assembly on Democracy in the UK. As you know, you will have seen this question a number of times. Really, we've come together and we've spent this time looking at how should democracy in the UK work? And this weekend, we're starting to get to serious decision-making time. Now, I know many of you, um, and the vast majority of you, completed a, a bit of a sort of survey or a, a polling uh, sheet during or between weekend five, weekend six. And that's really been used to help us sort of focus in on what we need to dig a bit deeper into this weekend and what things are starting to be those points of common ground. But as we move through the weekend, we're going to be sort of looking at making some decisions. So the agenda for this morning, um, we're going to the principles. Now, you know, the, these principles that emerge through weekend one, weekend two, and we've come back to and we've considered a bit further in all of the weekends. We've now, on the basis of the, um, the, the ballot that was done last week, ranked in order that they were agreed were they, they were important for establishing a good democracy. And I want you to keep these in mind when you're considering how these are reflected in the developing recommendations that are coming forward. The next, we're also going to this morning though, take a bit of time to sort of step back from this process of developing recommendations to really reflect on how, how you feel now about how democracy in the UK is working. We had some of these early conversations in weekend one, but it will be, you know, hopefully now having sort of spent a bit of time considering it, it'd be useful to think about how you're feeling now. And this is something we'll come back to again on Sunday to really look at how we can develop some, some more overarching messages about what we think about democracy. And then in the second part of the morning, we're going to be focusing on the things we really discussed in weekend three about reviewing and refining recommendations around where that balance of power should lie between government and parliament for different types of decisions. This afternoon, we're going to be focusing on the roles of the public. So the stuff that we really focused on in weekend four, we're gonna be looking specifically at the powers of the petition system in parliament and spending some time going back to the some of the emerging recommendations that are in the document that we sent you to sort of sense check how these fit together and so that they can become a package of recommendations about how petitions should be used. We're going to be considering um, some of the recommendations around the role of referendums as well, because as you know, anyone who's had a chance to have a look at the document will see there's there's a few different sort of propositions there that don't necessarily all sit well together. So we do need to start thinking about how do we put this into a package? And some of those big questions about, you know, whether that idea of a supermajority, so that having more than 50%, whether it's 60%, whether it's 55%, these sorts of things should be needed, or whether actually voter turnout should matter about the legitimacy of results. And we're also going to look at some of the things we talked about, about other ways for people to have influence, including deliberative processes like citizens' assemblies, but also that involvement in the, in the broader system of sort of representative democracy, for everything from voting to joining political parties to protest and campaign groups. So, and then tomorrow morning, we're going to come back to what we were talking about in weekend five, around the role of regulators in upholding ethical standards among MPs. And people who've looked at the document will see there's some nice 
clear, you know, some very clear statements from members about what they expect there. We're also going to look at some of the conclusions around the sort of emerging conclusions about the role the court should be able to play in limiting the laws government and parliament can pass. And as I said earlier, we're going to spend some time in the lighter part of Sunday looking at these sort of overarching statements about how you feel about the current state of democracy in the UK and what, what you'd like to say to some of these sort of decision makers and influencers. And then we're not going to come to our final votes within the session, especially online. It's a really hard thing to do, but also we'll be taking all the stuff you've been working on throughout Saturday and Sunday and some of the decisions you're making there and the tweaks you're making. So on Monday, we'll send you a final ballot form. You'll have till next Friday to complete it. It'll be really important that everybody does, you know, have their voice heard in that final decision. Because that will be the final set of recommendations made by the Citizens' Assembly. And hopefully you've noticed in the email that we sent you, we are inviting you on the evening of Monday the 20th to come back together if you like and hear the final results. To be the first ones to know what those results are. It, it's totally voluntary if you come along to that session, but we'd love to see you there. And there'll be an opportunity to have a bit of an informal chat about what you know, what's come out of the assembly as a whole. And then after Christmas, because we get a break too, we'll be writing up the full report of the assembly, which will not only have the final recommendations, but also all that process of reasoning that you've gone through to reach the conclusions. And that will be, you know, drawing all the jam boards and all the other things that you've been working on throughout the entire process. But before, yeah, you know, so that, that's where we're heading for the weekend. But what I want to start with now is just to sort of feed back to you the principles, which I'm sure are kind of a bit familiar to you now. You've looked at them over a number of weekends but in order that they were ranked as being sort of most important for action, as features for good democracy. And I encourage you to keep them in your head as we work through developing recommendations further today. So there were 10 actually that were sort of prioritized and strongly and agreed with by over 90% of the, the voting members. And the one that came out on top with the most high levels of agreement was that idea of honesty in politics. And that's something we've talked about right from the beginning as being vitally important. Systems of accountability and redress. So that actually, these are some things we were talking about in terms of regulation and stuff last week, that actually the public can see that actually, you know, politicians who are seen as doing a poor job can be challenged and you know, replaced or, or reprimanded. Rules of law that apply equally, something that's been coming up quite a lot, uh, both in our discussions, but also, you know, across the media and things recently. So not surprising, it's up there as the top three. Free and inclusive elections, that fundamental basis of our democracy that everyone is able to participate and have their vote count. Freedom of thought and speech, Again, I'm saying it's came up quite a lot in terms of some of the rights and, and yeah, rights and expectations that, that need to be protected. Six, transparency in decision making. So again, you know, wanting to know and be able to see how decisions are made, even if you don't, even if the public doesn't necessarily agree, that they can understand how decisions have been made and what's influenced decisions. Okay. Again, still supported by over 90%, respect for the fundamental human rights of people. And I think, you know, that, that's shown pretty clearly as a priority in some of the things we'll be discussing again tomorrow morning. And limits on the influence of the already powerful. Number nine, fair representation. So that once you elect somebody that, you know, they're there to represent you, your electorate, your communities, people around you. And 10, the idea that, you know, we want ministers who are knowledgeable in their policy areas so that we can trust that actually their recommendations, their decisions have come from a position of, of being informed. 
The next set were again, you know, highly prioritized by over 80%. So we're going down the list now. Remember there was 16 in total. So we're down to the 11 now, but still a very important one, an informed and educated voter base. So we talked a lot about in weekend four that actually, you know, people also have that responsibility if they expect things of, of their democracy to play their part and to play it in an informed way. Respect for the results of a vote. Again, so, you know, that idea that, you know, we are making democratic decisions in our country are made by, by votes very often, whether they're votes from the public, whether they're votes in referendums, whether they're votes in parliament, but actually, you know, there is that respect that's how decisions are very often made. Diversity in our elected representatives, and that comes up in some of the, one of your recommendations at least, that actually, you know, that wider range of people potentially standing to become parliamentarians. Power sharing, so that, you know, it's not all just handed over to government, but that parliament actually plays a strong role in decisions as well. And there is that, that, that wider representation and involvement in decisions, so that actually decisions are made for the population and the good of the people as a whole. <coughs> Although this started off quite high, it's one of the lowest ranked ones now, a commitment from elected governments to deliver on their manifestos. And while, you know, I think most of you, as we've been discussing, will agree that, you know, it's important that government is now able, once they're elected, able to deliver. But there are a lot of other things that need to be taken into account there as well. And the lowest ranked of the principles there, uh, still supported by over 70%, was about this no unelected bodies making political or policy decisions. And very early on, that started being a focus on some officials in the House of Lords, but definitely in weekend five, when you looked at this more closely, it moved on to recognizing though, although they're not elected, there is a role for the courts to be able to keep decision makers in check. So that is the, ranked order of the principles and I encourage you um, when you go into the discussions later to really sort of keep them in mind and think about them in, in relation to the types of recommendations you want to put forward. For now however we're going to pop you into your breakout rooms you'll have just a little bit to sort of check out who you're going to be working with um, this weekend Reflect on anything that's come out from the principles there and then start thinking about those wider pictures of democracy in the UK. I'll hand you over to your group facilitators. Breakout rooms are closing. We've, for anyone who, who was still midway through, midway through a sentence, you will be working with these groups for the whole weekend and you'll have an opportunity not just to finish your sentence next time you go into breakout rooms, but also when we, on the second half of Sunday, we'll be returning to this sort of bigger picture conversation around um, how democracy is working in the UK and how it feels at the moment and any of those sort of big overarching questions and messages that we want to put forward as an assembly. Before that, however, we've got quite a lot of work to do. As you've seen, from the document that we sent through to you, the overview, there were, when we did the, the sort of prioritizing vote um, between weekend five and weekend six, uh, there were a lot of things that people wanted to prioritize as things that needed to be, be considered and potentially put forward as recommendations. Just to, just to remind people that all of the things that are there as possible recommendations are possible. Throughout the course of this weekend, you might choose that actually, no, we've gone off that one entirely. Something that seemed like it was a really good idea in weekend three or weekend four, you know, might not seem like it was such a, you know, a good idea in weekend six, once you start to look at everything as a whole and that bigger picture of the sort of package of recommendations that both link with principles but also how they all work together and what we're trying to achieve overall. So just keep that in mind, that anything that's there is still very much possible. You will have the opportunity throughout, throughout the weekend 
to sort of suggest that things maybe need to change, tweak, be revised or be dropped. But you'll also have the opportunity at the end to individually support different recommendations or actually not support them. And that, that's what's important about this. This weekend's about having the conversation so that when we do that final vote, you know, we've found as much consensus as we can, but we all know, and we all, you know, this is one of the really healthy things is that not everyone agrees, not everyone agrees. So just to set you up now, as I said, we're going to be talking now about things that we focused on in week and three about the balance between balance of power between parliament and government and we spent a lot of time learning about how things actually work in that situation but then really considering well what you know what you know should there be uh, what should be the balance of power between parliament and government once government's been elected what what is the role of parliament and should the role of parliament potentially be strengthened. So you will remember from the um, from the, the ballot that we did between weekend five and weekend six, this proposed resolution about that we as an assembly believe the parliament needs to be able to play a stronger role in scrutinizing the actions of government. Collectively, it represents the voice of the elector as a whole, whereas not everyone voted for the government. Now, this resolution was put forward because actually it reflected the conclusions that you were drawing in weekend three. And very much you might remember there were things like the Mentimeter votes and things like this about where should the balance of power lie between parliament and government for a whole range of different types of decisions. So actually, and we asked people in the ballot for their kind of in principle, not a final decision yet, but in principle support to help shape how we organized this weekend. And actually there was in principle support for a stronger role for parliament in scrutinizing the action of government from 88% of the, the voting members. So we, we are at the moment, you know, starting this weekend from a position that the majority of you think that actually there's a need for that stronger role for parliament. And as you'll see from the overview document, there were 13 proposed or possible recommendations that were associated with, you know, that role, that balance between where parliament should be able to play a stronger role, where government should be able to, to move on and deliver what it's been elected to deliver. So they were divided up and they're divided up in the document in terms of when it comes to policy decisions. So these are, you know, the, the, the practice of actually, you know, operating as a government. There was another set that are around making new laws. So actually laws and legislation, including primary and secondary legislation. So remembering that, you know, secondary legislation is some of the stuff that government is able to make some very often smaller adjustments to laws and legislation without full parliamentary scrutiny. There's a third section there about proposing bills and deciding what parliament should discuss. And what are the roles of things like private members bills, you know, in terms of where that balance of time is spent within parliamentary discussions. And a third, a fourth one there about when parliament should sit. So when it goes in recess, when parliament can be, you know, put into recess and not no longer sitting and therefore debates not happening, and you know, the power to call elections, who should have the power to decide when an election is called, an early election is called. And across the membership who voted, there was this support for focusing on all of these 13 different recommendations between sort of, you know, 70 and 98% of, of the members who voted. So again, high level support that we need to focus on looking at these and developing all 13 a little bit further. Now, realistically, 13 is quite a lot to be looking at this morning. So we've, using those four different groups, we've allocated each group one of the kind of themes or sections to look at and focus on. And what we're gonna be asking you to do 
in your groups is to look at um, what's there as a possible recommendation. Look at the, the kind of, remind yourself of the current situation. Look at the commentary there. It's there, the commentary is there to sort of maybe give you suggestions or thoughts or ways that you might be able to tighten things up. It's not about trying to change what you might recommend, but very much they're designed to try and be helpful so that when other people who haven't been involved in the conversations that we have, read the recommendations, they're clear, they're strong, and they make the point that you're trying to make. Do remember that Meg and Alan are both here. And if there are things that you want, you know, a little bit more information or clarity on, you can call them into your rooms. But we're going to open up breakout rooms now and get you started. When we come back um, at about, well, yeah, just before 12 o'clock, we're going to be, it'll be an opportunity for each group to sort of feedback about some things that were important or the things that they're going, actually, we looked at this one and we, we really thought we needed to change, you know, change the wording a bit to make it stronger. And these are the reasons why. So do think about that as you're having your discussions, whether there's somebody who's going to volunteer to feedback for us later. Over to you in the breakout rooms. Okay, that looks like, yeah, it looks like most people have made it back. Um, is great and this is the part I'm looking forward to because this is when we who haven't been so involved in your in your conversations actually get to hear a bit about what you were focusing on what was the priorities things that you thought really you know where there were some of the the draft recommendations or the potential recommendations that that needed to be tightened and focused in more closely and why they were important uh, to really be there and I guess the thing to remember is that all of these um, potential recommendations or draft recommendations were being developed in the context that you'd started thinking about there needing to be a stronger role for, for Parliament um, and you know, Parliament more broadly, not just for government. So we're going to go in order. Now, as I said at the beginning, Different groups were looking at different aspects of this. We had recommendations or draft recommendations that ranged across from policy, from legislation, through to sort of who decides what is discussed in Parliament, and then some of the, the quite sort of practical things around sort of who decides recess, who decides when an election can be called. So we're going to start with the ones, the groups who were looking at uh, policy and policy making. And David, I believe you're feeding back on behalf of Group One. Um, yes, I am. My group all stepped back. Um, right. stepped forward. They all stepped back, and um, the word of the word that, one of the words that emerged from my group was discombobulated. Um, it was used quite a few times during the morning, so there was quite a sense uh, that we found um, this quite wordy and challenging to work on and dense, and um, we struggled with it a bit. Um, but in in relation to recommendation one. B, um, which reads when significant new policies are proposed by the government that are outside their manifesto commitments or are responding to changing circumstances, there should be opportunity for full parliamentary debate and public scrutiny before they are implemented. Um, we felt that this and others uh, policy ones were really about trying to keep government honest and transparent and that that was really, really important that um, there were processes that didn't allow government uh, to just push things through on the QT or to overly hastily and without enough um, debate and scrutiny. So we felt that was really important, but we also felt that this um, statement along with others was a little bit confusing and contradictory maybe. We wondered about this public scrutiny aspect. aspect. What does that look like? It sounds very complicated. So I think we were proposing that perhaps that should be removed um, because we didn't really understand how that could be achieved um, uh, in an effective way. Um, but in, in broad terms, we definitely agree there should be as much honesty and transparency as, po as possible. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, so, yeah, focusing on well, what does that public scrutiny mean? How do we make that meaningful in, in the recommendations? 
So I think we've got Karen from group two. Be interesting to hear which one you were sort of feeding back and focusing on. So yeah, so ours was the also 1B uh, that we wanted to feed back on. So um, again, interesting, when significant new policies are proposed by the government that are outside their manifesto commitments or respond to changing circumstances, there should be opportunity for full parliamentary debate and public scrutiny before they're implemented. So we did agree with this, but we we actually added in something else, which was um, in, to, an, to an enable um, people to understand, we've added that we should have information presented in a balanced and unbiased and transparent way, so to the public um, and parliament before um, the decisions are made and then implemented. So um, we just added that in. So um, we thought, again, supporting what you've just said, David, it was really about honesty and making sure everybody's informed with um, brought on the journey with the decision so that people know how we've made that decision. So, but it was really, really important that we wanted the information to be balanced, you know, both sides, unbiased um, from the media particularly, um, so that people have an informed position to see whether they agree or not with the new policy. Um, but hearing what you've said, I can agree, public scrutiny, how far do you go? Um, but we definitely thought what's broadcast out needs to be um, balanced. Hey, yeah. thanks, Karen. And interesting that okay. two groups there have, have really sort of picked up on, on sort of similar, well, one of, well, the same sort of draft recommendations needing that clarity and what does it, how do we make this meaningful in practice? So no, thank you very much for that. And Janet, I think you were feeding back to the third group that was looking at some policy making. Hi, uh, my group also stepped back like David. Um, That's um, I think a lot of that's to do with like David's group. We, it, it, we just really tussled with this. It's difficult. Um, so but this, the same one, 1B, about um, significant new policies. We had a lot of discussion about significance as a word and how it's subjective and you know how would you define it and and at least one person thought it should actually be quantified in some way um, and there was a suggestion that that the um there's there's a it's the significance would be defined by a cross-party group and there was a suggestion that we could simplify the recommendation by taking that out but i think the group on balance felt really strongly that that should stay in because mm. then it would be looked at in a in a representative fair way by, by all parties rather than by the government as a whole, or the, sorry, the parliament as a whole, which then the government would win because the government has the majority. So that was important. Um, but it was also important that the government shouldn't be able to um, introduce new policies without, without full debate and scrutiny in, in the case of an emergency on, that, that are permanent. Those, anything like that would have to be on a temporary basis and would need to be reviewed after a period of months. And at that point in time, that full debate and public scrutiny would have to happen. We didn't, we didn't get as far as kind of rewording or whatever, but we've put a load of post-its on the jam board that kind of hopefully get those things across. And then I can just quickly, if you want, look at 1C, because we did have a very quick discussion about 1C and neither of the other groups has, has uh, maybe got that yep. far. Um, not that we had much time for it, um, but basically on one C says in the interest of public, in the interest of transparency, there should be a public record of the expert advice given to the government to inform their policy decisions so that members of the public can understand the basis of that decision, even if they don't agree with it. And there were some things in the commentary about areas that might need to be protected from that, like um, defence and national security type um, issues. And I think the main point here was that we felt that Actually, what's really important is to know where the advice has come from, um, even if it's not, even if there are reasons for not telling us what the actual advice is. So, you know, we don't want the advice to have come from a spin doctor. We want it to have come from a relevant specialist. I'll, I'll stop now because that's getting long, but. No, no, thank you. And yeah, good to pick up on the one that wasn't picked up there around that, you know, information and transparency, which come back to some of the, the principles that we were sort of presented back earlier in the morning, seem to be coming through really strongly there. So it's really useful to hear. Um, and hopefully you, you will all end up being, uh, being voting on all of, all of these recommendations potentially. So, you know, this is a chance to sort of hear a bit some of the arguments and, and about some of the proposed changes that might go in before you vote for the topics that you weren't so deeply discussing. 
So now we're going to go on to the groups that were looking at legislation and lawmaking. And I think we've got Louise. Louise C from Group 4. Hello there, yes. Well, we also had a, a debate about the word significance and um, came up with the idea that it should be defined as any legal changes that would affect a large number of people in a negative way. So for instance, um, they could end up with fines um, and in particular minority and vulnerable groups. Um, and who decides, again, a cross-party committee, but involve experts on the issue um, with the idea that it's trying to achieve openness and honesty, as well as accountability in protection of the people, so visibility. Um, and then ultimately it takes everyone into consideration so that democracy does indeed work for all. Thank you. And uh, yeah, the, the significance word is a difficult one. And we, we struggled with it when it kept coming up across a number of the recommendations because it is that thing. There are so many ways of defining it, but also you can't give a specific example necessarily of what, like in our recommendations in terms of what is specific. But I like the idea of, you know, that idea of particularly significance coming in play when it is that larger number of people and potentially especially that sort of potential to be affected in, in more negative or pecuniary ways. Thank you. Um, I think we've got Mike from Group 5. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, we looked at, um, well, we got through two of them and, the, and Fabia got to the third one, but uh, we, we, I'm feeding back on 1D. Um, we had a big debate about what the word significant meant in terms of legal changes and yeah. who defined what was significant. Um, it was clear to us that it was about the government having to be accountable and transparent. Um, but we were a little bit anxious that if the people in general had to scrutinise every single piece of legislation, the whole of government would grind to a halt. Um, and we were also anxious about the fact that it was uh, protecting the basic human rights of people within society in general, not just those who had elected the, whoever, whichever government happened to be in power at that time. Mm -hmm. So we did have a, an attempt at rewording it because we felt that um, it wasn't within our ability to define what was significant and that, that experts in inverted commas would need to be involved in that. So we suggested a slight change to the wording and basically to say government should not be able to make significant legal changes, whether through primary or secondary legislation, without proper scrutiny, rather than um, to change, without proper yeah. scrutiny by the people and or their representatives in parliament. And then we added a sentence about cross party committee would be deter, uh, would determine what is a significant legal change. So if there was minor things, that would be fine. But when it was something that was more important that the parliamentary committee be convened to make that kind of judgment. Okay, thank you. And there seems to be some sort of growing themes there around this idea of significance. And, and the, the rewording there's interesting we'll have to sort of look at these. as. As people are aware, you know, there is that, um, you know, three, three groups or three or four groups have been looking at some of the different ones and we'll have to combine some of these suggestions, but that idea about, you know, effective or proper scrutiny and how do we, how do we really define public, like full public scrutiny as well might need to be clarified, whether directly in the recommendations or in the sort of text that gets associated with each one. But thank you very much, Mike. That was, that was interesting. And now we've got Steve from Group 6. Well, to be honest, it's probably already been said by the two groups before, but um, we, we, we felt that there was no major change needed uh, in the actual wording, apart from we, we wanted the word fully adding uh, before scrutiny because we, did, we wanted to be sure people looked at this legislation and did actually fully scrutinise it, as opposed to just giving it a cursory glance and just going and accepting it. Uh, we also struggled with the word significant because it, you know, it's a bit ambiguous really. And yeah. it, it means different things to different people. 
and in fact we brought Alan in as well to uh, just give us a, a bit of help on that uh, because the way it was talking about a cross-party group looking at the word you know what's significant and what's not again would that be a cross-party group that would come up with uh, what's significant for every legislation or for each individual legislation there was concerns that looking at everything in depth could delay decisions being made in parliament so you know but the rest was covered by the two previous groups and i happened to slip forward as everybody was slipping back that's why i'm doing this look it's great like, you know hopefully it's not too scary having to just to feed back on some of this stuff and you know we, we can all just have this conversation and i really appreciate it when people are able to step forward but i also you know in groups that you know if people don't want to that's also okay that your facilitators get paid to do this too so you know we can make them okay thank you steve so we're going on now to the groups that were looking at the at the proposed recommendations around um what is discussed in parliament so can i come to uh i think we've got david from group seven Still on mute at the minute, Dave. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to see my picture in order to unmute myself, um, sort of permanently rather than simply. Uh, oh, here I am. Yep, you're here. Oh no, you've just muted yourself again. Right. Yep. Um, our group was charged with the job of looking at um, private members' bills um, and assessing their importance and seeing how more time could be allocated for the debate of private members' bills. Well, I think we all recognise, though, that time is limited um, mm -hmm. and it would never be possible to, to debate all private members' proposals. But it was important that private members' bills should be debated because these are the things that the public might be interested in that the government has not proposed in its programme. And in some cases it was important that things that the government was actively opposed to should nevertheless be debated although it was acknowledged that if the government is in charge of the uh, uh, of the national budget then they do have a shall we say a, a say in the matter um we didn't really resolve the problem of more time i think because obviously parliamentary time is limited so given that there isn't enough, how should it be decided who, what gets debated and what doesn't? And there were two proposals on the table. One of them was to have a cross-party um, committee of members of parliament to make that decision. And there was one member of the group who supported that, um, but the majority were in favor of a citizen's jury although there was a certain amount of um, disagreement within that group about how the citizens jury should be selected. Some saying it should be completely random, others saying effort should be made to ensure that it was more truly representative. Um, a couple of significant things I think are the, the idea of a cross-party committee deciding on what gets debated in the House has been proposed by the House, but the government has not scheduled time for debate on it, um, which I think gives you some idea of the imbalance between the power of government and parliament. The other thing on which we were absolutely unanimous was that the idea that private members' proposal should be talked out, should be absolutely debarred. I think that summarizes, but um, please anybody else come in if I've missed anything. And thank you for that, David. And yeah, the, the proposal there that was sort of touched on at the end about this idea that private members' bills could just be talked out so they don't get resolved and time gets used up is something I think a lot of your recommendations were trying to think about. Well, how do we how do we overcome that and make what does happen in Parliament, particularly around private members' bills, a bit more meaningful potentially? So thank you, David. Um and I think we've got Yes, actually, yeah, for group eight, we've got Andy, is it? Who's also also focusing on this idea of what gets debated in Parliament. That would be me. Um, 
Great. Again, <laughs> uh, basically, as a group, we thought that the wording within 1G could be tightened up a little bit. Um, just as an example, in the first paragraph it says MPs need to have the ability to ensure that issues that are important to the public. We thought the word need could be replaced with the word must have the ability to ensure that issues that are important to the public are brought up. Um, but we also felt that it, it needs to be a more specific process resulting in a commitment to have issues covered by cross-party committee or along that line um, so that they would be considered properly, properly by uh, parliament slash government. Um, with regards to 1H and 1J, we thought there was the possibility of combining these for a hybrid, um, whereby you have a combination of the two. Um, I haven't actually got the details in front of me on the thingy board, so, but as a rough thing, um, so that uh, you have a mechanism for petitions and private members' bills to find their way into parliamentary debate. Um, it was also thought that as your average parliament is over a four-year period, if a private member's bill is brought up in the first year of parliament and it receives um, support in a free vote, that could then be uh, assigned a time period in the second quarter of the parliament or, yeah, second quarter of the parliament okay. where it must be discussed. Um, and <laughs> trying to work out what the circumstances and how do you actually make it? I mean, it was it was brought up that the mechanisms to make Parliament or to make government actually do something usually go along the lines of petition, um, MPs, cross party yeah. committees, etc. So you have to put the mechanisms in place to get government to have to listen or to have to take action on it. Uh, with regard to 1K, we thought that there is the chance possibly of extending or committing to a larger number of weeks within a parliamentary year. Um, one of our members actually looked at and something about fifth, fifth year 15 or parliamentary year in 2015, they sat for 32 weeks. And we thought this could probably be extended. Um, we'll be generous to them. We'll give them 10 weeks off a year. So a 42 week parliamentary sitting or something along those lines would be a good idea because it would promote more time. Um, that, yeah, which is great because that's picking up on some of the things that the, the last groups were discussing there as well. And it is, there's, there's mechanisms that exist and some of the things you were talking about with the parliamentary committees and things like, it's about how do we best use these different mechanisms to, to, drive, to drive a situation where more of the things, uh, more things are able to be discussed and, some, and the government's not able to as you were saying there to be able to sort of yeah block it out i was going to say as a generalization over all of it we feel that the, there's some elements of the wording to remove ambiguity and what have you the wording needs tightening up whereby it's a commit it it forces a commitment from government to actually do something okay and we'll definitely be picking up on some of those ideas when we talk about some petitions as well later today but it sounds like all of you groups are giving me a lot of work to do okay so we've got matt coming now from group nine hi everybody so uh we had a good discussion on particularly on points one h and one j um so we we definitely agree that we needed a, a more robust system for deciding which private members bills or petitions do get and time for discussion in parliament rather than the current ballot system that we have at the moment but we took quite a different view than group seven. So we didn't particularly like as a group uh, recommendation 1J around using a citizen's jury. We felt the proposal of 1H was, was better, which was around having that cross party committee. Um, we felt that you know we have a representative democracy and therefore we should be relying on our MPs to make decisions on our behalf most of the time. And we felt that that was more consistent with the um, prioritization of the principles from the assembly around having clear accountability for decisions being made and then having okay. systems of redress on people who are making those decisions so by having a defined 
um, cross-party group of MPs, it allowed those, um, those, those principles to be applied more robustly. Thanks, Matt. And I think that's really interesting, thinking back on that sort of principle about the sort of, you know, accountability and redress and, you know, where, yeah, where could that fall if you then were, in this case, giving the authority to maybe a citizens panel or, you know, whereas parliamentary system exists for that reason. No, interesting. We've got two more groups to feed back, and these were the groups who were looking about when, you know, who should be able to call recess or decide when parliament sits and or when an election is called. So I think we've got Doreen from group 10. It's going to be yeah, and I'm just going to share a screen for Doreen. That's all right. Still on mute, Doreen, I think. We just need to unmute you, Doreen. Yep. Hi. Right. I can't get rid of, oh, hi. Um, we were talking about, um, well, I'll read it to you. Um, the government should propose when parliament goes to recess, when with MPs able to debate and amend the proposal before a vote in parliament. Government can, however, recall Parliament in the case of exceptional circumstances, stroke emergency. Um, and we've sort of uh, juggled that about a bit and said that government should only be able to propose when recess takes place and MPs should be able to debate and amend the proposal before a vote in Parliament. Government can, however, recall Parliament in the case of exceptional circumstances, stroke emergency. Um, and what is at the heart of this recommendation, it was to give Parliament some control as to when it goes into recess. Uh, and why is this important to democracy? To enable Parliament to prevent government using recess as a way of avoiding a sticky topic. Okay, so that's very clear there, that strengthening up the, the ability of, of Parliament there to actually be able to push back on, you know, as you said, government using calling an early recess to just avoid having to ask, answer questions. Thank you, Doreen. And our final group, we've got Michael from group 11. Good afternoon. I'm just waiting for my facilitators to share the screen. Right, Gary's we good. had, yeah, we had possible recommendation 1N. The Prime Minister should only be able to call an early general election if it is supported by a vote in the House of Commons. We felt the Prime Minister should have to have a vote on it and should not be able to call a general election to be tactical uh, when they think they're going to win. Mm -hmm. And also... Hang on, where are we? The, we did think that Parliament should stay in for a term of four years and that really, unless there's exceptional circumstances, that no early general election should be called, and especially, as I said before, for tactical reasons when it suits the PM or party in power. Okay, no, very, very clear there that, you know, that, that idea that if Parliament's elected, it sort of sits its term unless there's a really significant reason, but then it has to be a parliamentary um, agreed decision there. Okay, thank you. As I said, um, you've given me lots of work. What, what we're going to be doing between now and Monday is taking the suggestions from across the groups. We're not ne obviously we're not necessarily going to be able to implement every single suggestion there, but where we we're looking at it, seeing where the themes are, seeing where the priorities are, and it will all come back. The final versions, well, the versions will come back to you as a final vote. We won't be removing anything from that list at the moment unless you know there's significant agreement to do so. So thank you very much for that. When we come back this afternoon, we have number of things that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at, again, at the sort of petitions, again, at 
the role of referendums and the role of things like delivery processes and citizens assemblies. We're going to be, there's a couple of, when you do get a chance to look at those proposed recommendations, there's a few that don't quite contradict each other, but you know, are sort of different alternatives that we might want to be having a look at. So we're going to be drawing out some of those challenges um, later this afternoon and potentially making some decisions about you know, are all of these things that we are going to take forward to the final vote as potential recommendations. So until then, um, thank you for this morning. Hopefully we are, we, we're getting to a point where we're starting to make decisions and it's, I, I love hearing back from you all about the discussions you've been having this really interesting, nuanced and in-depth conversations going on in these groups and it's great to hear. So, Enjoy your lunch and we will see you at two o'clock. <laughs>